Dig. Dig into the earth and look at the layers in the soil. At the base lies a gravel or glacial till deposited by receding glaciers more than 10,000 years ago. It is only in the top 10 to 20 centimeters, the rich nutrient soil, which most plants can grow. Without this topsoil, there can be no crops, and with no crops, there is no food. Lose the soil, and it can take millennia for it to rebuild. Traditional farming methods left the prairie soils vulnerable to the wind. This is a story about that soil, about a farmer who was an innovator, businessman, and leader. Charles Sherwood Noble so loved the soil that he devoted his life to its preservation. Grandpa had qualities that I think the other men recognized uh, were excelling. Everybody called him the chief. Yeah, he was a great man. C.S. Noble uh, would, would concentrate on one dream that he had for a, an extended period of time and bring it to fruition. The Canadian prairies were once a rich grassland that fed great buffalo herds. It was only in the mid-1800s with the first research expeditions passing through Western Canada that any studies of the landscape were completed. Perhaps the best known was the Palliser Expedition. In passing through the southern prairie, Palliser reported the land to be desert or semi-desert in character, which can never be expected to become occupied by settlers. The region later became known as the Palliser Triangle. A later survey in advance of the railroad across Canada, conducted by botanist John McCowan, gave an entirely different view of the landscape. McCowan reported that the land was among the richest and most productive in Canada. The Canadian Pacific Railway was so impressed with McCowan's report that they changed their planned route across the country. In the end, both men were right in their assessments. Palliser travelled through the region in a dry year and McCowan in one of the wettest. To the settlers who followed the railroad and began to farm, they faced a blessing and a curse. The land had good soil, but there was precious little rainwater for the crops. When your mother your, and your father sit there looking at the sky and, oh, I hope it rains. We gotta have rain, if we don't get a rain, what, what's going to happen? Well, how are we going to send these kids to school in the fall? And where are the clothes going to come from? And, you know, so naturally it had an effect on you too, you know. Among those close to 10,000 settlers a year that came to the West, arriving to the Clare's home area in 1903 was one 29-year-old man named Charles Sherwood Noble. Born to a poor farm couple in Iowa, Noble's enthusiasm, innovation, and dogged determination would revolutionize dryland farming, dramatically changing agricultural practices internationally for decades to come. In the old days, everybody used to plow. Started with horses, and then they had steamers, all seeded. Pretty soon, there was nothing left, but the wind's coming, and then that was the end of everything, just about, until C.S. Noble came along. With extraordinary instinct and foresight, C.S. Noble had seen evidence of what happens when the soil blows away in his earlier farming years south of the border. Driven by his passion to preserve the soil, conserve the moisture, and produce a better yield, he began experimenting with his first farm in the Claresholm area. He married Margaret Naomi Fraser a year after he arrived, and the next year they had purchased 4,000 acres of land. C.S. could be seen striding barefoot behind his early plows. His sales and business skills were impressive, and by 1918, his holdings included 56 sections, almost all in cultivation, and over $2 million in assets. Charles Noble had become Canada's biggest farm operator, and one of the largest in the world. His farming methods were so good that uh, he grew a, a record oats crop and a record flax crop, and in 1916 he grew a record wheat crop. 
The new town of Nobleford was named in honor of the man, who then established his noble foundation company in 1913. But it was not all success for the chief. Hard economic times depleted essentially all of CS's wealth by 1922, but this did not stop him from rebuilding and continuing to innovate and prosper. I was born in, on a farm there. They, they were hard years because uh, it was only was a half a section of dry land, and so he had to support a family of 12 on a half section of dry land. And as you have known about all the dust storms that went around the Noble Fort area, we experienced those too. I can remember there were days my mother was putting claws on the windows and trying to keep the dust out, and you couldn't see anything outside. And the thistles were just blowing by, you know, it was a terrible, depressing time, really. Well, this country, the land had a tendency to blow away all the time. The drought and black dust storms of the Depression years in the 1930s were enough to convince most that Palliser's findings were accurate. Southern Alberta was hard hit by the loss of soil that came with the extreme windstorms. It's awful to see all that good soil going away. We, w we had to walk three miles to school and dust storms and when we got there, we were, our faces were just blackened with dirt. And when we got home, we the same way. During the 30s, we had a lot of wind and, and, and dust storms with, uh, through summer following. We'd, we'd summer follow, when the summer followed, they'd either use a plow or, or a one-way disc. And that would turn the, all the trash under and leave your topsoil free of, uh, of any protection. And the blade, we left the traps. The trash was all left on top and kept the land from, from blowing. In 1935, C.S. Noble invented the first Noble blade during a rare family holiday to California. He came up with the design after seeing how they loosened sugar beets in the field, leaving the top undisturbed. Completing the blade in California, he pulled it home on a trailer behind his car. So this noble blade was designed to leave the stubble mulch on top and uh, so, so the wind wouldn't blow the soil away. We, we built the first factory in 41 for a dollar a day. That's all we got for wages, a dollar a day. And that's where we started to do the really manufacturing on a bigger scale. We had uh, about 20 employees in the first factory. There's a picture of uh, all my crew there. I, uh, I was production manager in the first factory and the big factory. I uh, hired uh, all the employees and managed all the manufacturing. I don't really think at that time that there was a water system into the factory as from the, the village. The engineer said, why don't we build a cistern and catch all that runoff? Because that will last you all year. And they piped it down from the roof over to the cistern and uh, that's where they ran a lot of the hard facers. And I th think that they also ran the bathrooms off of that too. I mean, their shipping got bigger, they manufactured more stuff, so they had to ship more stuff, making new models and stuff, and they built an R&D building and designed stuff there, and then they'd bring it in and, and make it in the shop. One guy, he'd cut with a torch, he'd fit everything with a torch, you know, clamp it together and tack it, and then they'd move it down the line, and each guy would put one on a rack where he could turn it, rotate it, you know. So he just welded it up and then it went to the painter where he cleaned it all off, scraped it all off, and then painted it. So then it would be shipped out to the yard where he loaded it on the trucks. A lot of heavy work, you know, heavy, heavy lifting. A lot of these standards weighed 250 pounds and you had to try to wrestle those around. And it was very primitive. So it took a long time for loading a truck. The raw materials came mostly from uh, Algoma steel in Ontario. Well, we were well stocked with noble equipment. About four different models of, of the normal blade. 
plus we had the noble sea drill. Drill was very heavy duty to go, go seed, to seed deeply down to moisture. It had to be strong and the hose on the drill had to stay vertical, not drag behind the drill. In 50, 51, 52, we built the, the big factory. All the walls were bought from the hangers from Pierce. And then, uh, then we really start building cultivators. Of course, it was a big improvement because we had a lot more space then. And uh, they built a, a spur line from the railroad track, and that's where all our steel then finally came in. Came these big cars that come right into the shop, and they were unloaded with a big overhead crane, and uh, which was a lot easier, a lot faster, and you didn't matter what the weather was. The new and larger Noble factory was built to keep up with the demand for blades and the new seed drill. The factory also produced blades for other manufacturers and road graders. As tractors grew more powerful, blades also became increasingly larger and more complex. Different blades were sold throughout the world. As an employer who not only took good care of their employees, but was flexible with farmers' schedules, Noble cultivators was the place to work. Many of the Noble family members, including children Shirley, Gerald and Aline, took management roles or worked with the company. We had perfected the blade. The blade was a perfect machine that we had. We hired uh, Barry Rogers, uh, an, an engineer who, he developed our blade machine to, it was practically a work of art. Everything was centered around the factory. You, you just knew it was a fa noble factory town. Uh, most of the people at that time, most of the people did work in the factory. It was good, a good job. We lived right in town. There was no traveling. Noble Ford was a good place to live. We, we all got a bonus, Christmas bonus. So in order to repay them, the, the employees they put on the Christmas parties and they, they invited the, the owners. It would be worthwhile living over again. <laughs> you didn't just go to work just to do a job, collect your pay and go home. You kind of felt like you were part of it. We were just kind of treated like family. If you could come up with a better idea, they were more than willing to listen, you know, whatever it might be. And so everybody's always kind of, uh, not to get a pat on the back or an extra dollar in your pocket. It was just, you did it, just like you do at home. I never asked anybody to do what I couldn't do myself. And when I went home on the end of, of the day, or whatever, or the end of the week, whatever, I was just as dirty with black clothes as the other ones that I worked with. And the best workers I had there, you can believe it or not, they were women. The only girl when I came and they thought maybe I could help them out and I said okay for three months and stayed three years. Taking letters from Mr. Noble or Gerald or, or, or CS, we had a, a dictaphone, I didn't use that very much, uh, the shorthand worked better for me. In 1979, the company was sold to Versatile. The face of agriculture had changed again and demand for the blade was decreasing. To this day, his legacy as a self-made man lives on. A variation of the Noble Blade is still in production by all major farm equipment manufacturers. And the original factory building houses the Nobleford Area Museum Society. We had to give him full credit for inventing it. It was a machine for its time. <laughs>